Bear Down Chicago Bears, according to the NFL.com website, the Chicago Bears are set to be the 2024 Cinderella team. Now, um, you might be wondering, what's this all about? Why is uh, there a lot of hype, if you will, uh, behind the Chicago Bears, who are projected by draft books to only have eight and a half wins? What does it look like? Well, this is projection based on the potential and the possibility of this team being a whole lot better than what the perceived product will be. And the reason for that is coming down to one man right now, and that is Caleb Williams. I mean, the guy should be Ryan Poles, but the idea here is that uh, Caleb Williams is going to rep represent a paradigm shift for the position of quarterback for the Chicago Bears, that going forward, that we should see a fantastic result because of the abilities that Caleb William has displayed in uh, a lot of different draft projections, in a lot of different evaluations, that this team is going to be greater than uh, the sum of some of the parts that have not yet come together yet. And guys, here's the funny thing. I've been telling you this all this time. So to hear somebody else finally illustrating that potential is very good to see. Now, the difference between me and them is that my idea here did revolve around, because I'm the first to admit it, uh, my idea revolved around me feeling that Justin Fields would be the guy that would give us the better chance for that win. And you know what? Uh, I, I'm gonna. St I'm always gonna stick with that because, and we do have a, a an update on Justin Fields for anybody who is still interested in what's going on with Justin Fields. We're gonna do a quick update on that. But uh, you know, Caleb Williams. The more I watch, the more I watch. And by the way, the more I watch, I'm watching because not because I I think that Caleb Williams is better, just because I'm trying to convince myself that. You know, this makes a lot more sense. Now, uh, with that being said, and with that in mind, I did change my draft. I know I told you this week that I was just I was just going to keep drafting down, but and just keep drafting down and just trying to accumulate picks. But it doesn't do uh, it, it doesn't do much. like it, it's not accomplishing anything. So we're going to stop after the three days uh, of the J.J. McCarthy taking, if you will. And we're just going to draft Caleb Williams at number one. And then I'm going to try to be more in line with what I think the Bears are going to do and with what the reports are that are coming out. In fact, a warning was issued to Braxton Jones just recently indicating that, you know, maybe, just maybe, there might be an offensive tackle challenging him for that position very soon. And you know what? Competition is a great thing. And this Bears team probably needs that sort of competition. So, uh, you know, why not? So uh, let's kick it off, though with what's going on uh, with Caleb Williams making magic, by the way, guys, if you haven't already uh, and, and consider subscribing to the channel. And if you would hit that like button, because it helps push me up in the algorithm, whether you're watching now or whether you're watching a later broadcast, it certainly helps me in the algorithm. If you take the time, once you've watched this video to hit that like button, if you don't like it, hit the dislike button. It still works the same way. It still pushes me in the algorithm. And the more people that dislike me or like me one way or another, it helps me, I assure you. Thank you so much for tuning in as well. So uh, with Caleb Williams making magic, the Chicago Bears will be NFL's Cinderella team in 2024. Now, that's a lot to, to put on a, a kid, but I have a feeling that maybe, just maybe, this might be that feeling. And the person that's making this is Adam Shine. And he says the NCAA men's basketball turn is rocking and rolling, blah, 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 blah. And we're looking for Cinderella teams. And with that, let's look at a Cinderella team in the NFL. In the seven previous years that I've done this, I've made selections that look good. Uh, the, the Jaguars, the 2017 Jaguars, 2018 Bears, the 2019 Bills, 2022 Dolphins all went on to make the playoffs. And well, not so good. The 2020 Cardinals, 2021 Chargers, and the 2023 Saints did not. But one thing I've never done before, choose a squad that is likely to be helmed by a rookie quarterback. Uh, did he just say that when he said the 2018 Chicago Bears? What the fuck? He's going. Cool. All right. So, so this guy's already. 
All right, this is partly because of timing. It's not always possible at this juncture of the calendar to see <laughs> with much certainty that the top quarterback prospect will end up. And when it's possible to project a pair this far ahead in the draft, it usually becomes a team played its way into the number one position. This usually indicates the roster isn't ready to support a Cinderella-esque run right away. This year is different. The Chicago Bears currently meet both requirements, as their fans definitely know. Um, uh, there are two criteria. Uh, number one, they have not made the playoffs in the previous season, and it shouldn't be widely considered to be a Super Bowl contender, neither of which really apply to the Chicago Bears at this point. So uh, when March rolls through, though, my 2024 Cinderella team will not be in the running for the repeat honors because the Bears are about to win a minimum of 10 games and make the postseason. Thank you very much. I like the fact that he's validating my opinion, uh, the opinion that I've had for a long, long time so far. Uh, yes, I know this column is not meant to be a playoff prediction. I don't usually lock those in until after Labor Day, but I just have to be bold with Chicago because of how much I love what the Bears have done and what they're about to do. Let's consider what they've accomplished so far. And if you don't like, uh, if you don't like some of the stuff on here, uh, that's okay. Okay, there, there's. You, let's let's. Put this into context. That's the important part: is the ability, the ability to put this into context, so that you guys can digest it as much. And by the way, who is your favorite free agency signing? Put that in the description or put that in the comments down below. Who is your best signing in free agency for this season? I still cannot believe General Manager Ryan Poles nabbed Keenan Allen from the Chargers in exchange for a fourth round pick. That was an amazing steal. Allen might be able, uh, might be about to turn thirty two, but he's still a great receiver coming off a monster season, 108 catches, 1,243 yards, and seven touchdowns. He's an experienced, ultra-reliable veteran with great hands, route-running skills, and leadership capabilities. Uh, I love how he'll mesh with DJ Moore, a king of yards after the catch and highlight real-type plays. The Allen Moore pairing is going to be a terrific, dynamic one-two punch. The offensive improvements weren't limited to Keenan Allen, though. Don't overlook the underrated signing of Gerald Everett, who should make a solid partner for budding stud Cole Komet at tight end and new running back DeAndre Swift as a good runner with reliable hands out of the backfield. I liked his addition before, but it looks even better now that Allen is in the fold. By the way, good morning to Jay Grizz. Good morning of, to Yada, uh, to Ray. Good morning. Uh, Patriot Watch USA says, won't be hard to outplay fields. We won seven games last year, five by JF, so nine to 11 games in our sights with upgrades that we made. And by the way, I don't even say nine uh, at, at this at this point, Patriot. I really think that this is an 11-win or better team, that it would be a, to, to me, it would be almost a catastrophe to see 10 wins. And I know that I'm, I'm, I'm parsing uh, I'm parsing this uh, between, you know, 10 and 11, but um, I, I don't think that we lose to Detroit at all. I don't think that we lose to Minnesota at all. I, I think I think that this is going to be the moment where we turn it around against Green Bay for one of two. You know what I mean? And then after that, uh, by the way, we did have the the, the we, we we did have the schedule. We didn't have when they were going to play. And like I don't, I'm not afraid of anything. There was nothing in that schedule that made me afraid. You know what I mean? Like there was nothing that I saw that made me say, well, shit, there's a definite loss right there. Suddenly this team feels competitive with everybody. And that's a very good feeling to have. So I feel pretty good about where the Bears are. So on the other side of the ball, Paul smartly retained terrific playmaker Jalen Johnson. By the way, might be a playmaker coming back that should have been a bigger playmaker that wasn't. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. To headline a strong group of defensive backs, which now includes Kevin Byard, uh, Matt Eberflus defense operated at a different level last season after pass rusher Montez Sweat arrived. Poles was right to hand Sweat a mega buck extension and uh, to continue leading Chicago's excellent front seven. With a full season of Sweat rushing the passer, the Bears' D should become a true force. Now, of course, we've already talked about it. There are some pieces that don't fit with the defense so far, but it's probably going to be still a very tough, uh, a very tough team with a favorable schedule. It has to be noted that we really have a, a pretty good schedule out here. One of Paul's true strokes of brilliance came not this offseason, but about one year ago when he traded away the number one pick to the Panthers. Not only did he net more in that deal, he traded Carolina's first rounder. Uh, but he landed Carolina's first rounder this year, which, because of the Panthers' two win season, becomes number one. Um, I like Justin Fields. I don't think he was always put in the best position, 
Uh, I think he will end up starting and playing well in Pittsburgh. And I understand why Poles said trading fields was probably one of the harder things he had to do. Also, by the way, Kevin Warren did come out for, for anybody who's curious. And he did say that, you know, he felt that it was important to do right by Justin. He really kind of echoed the same sentiment uh, that Ryan Poles did. And I want to say that Kevin Warren, Ryan Poles, uh, even Matt Eberflus to an extent, like I really like the way these guys are starting to come together. You know, are they always going to get it right? No. Are they always going to do what's best for everybody? No. At the end of the day, there is something very important that, that, you know, we should probably point out. Nobody cares about you in the NFL unless you show something special. Um, if Justin Fields would have been a horrible quarterback, I mean, I mean, horrible, horrible, not, not just, uh, not accomplishing much horrible. Look, there's a different type of horrible. Um, then we probably would not have cared. And we probably wouldn't have invested so much um, sentiment into Justin Fields thinking that he could be that guy. But he did show flashes of brilliance. He did show largely that he was a guy who was capable uh, or adept at potentially fulfilling that quote unquote prophecy, if you will. The fact that he didn't, uh, I mean, that's, I, I don't like that. You know, I, I, I think that sucks. However, however, um, I, I, I feel like this this, these people have come onto a page here where they've all gotten together and they've realized, look, we have to be better people. These are not just, you know, just because they're just because these athletes are coming in here and they're playing hard, you know, they're not commodities for us. But the point is like, if, if the person doesn't do really good, you don't give a shit about them. Like, you know, we pretend that we do, but we really don't. Right. Um, we ask loyalty from a, a player. You know, we ask, uh, for we want Cal when Caleb Williams comes in here, we're going to ask Caleb Williams, especially if he's really good. We're going to ask him to love Chicago from now until the end of time. And how dare he not move on? If he sucks, we're going to throw him out as soon as possible. So when I say this, I do want to preface it with, you know, it's the good players that get that special, you know, feeling, if you will. Uh, and in this situation, I think they, you know, look, Justin Fields didn't fulfill what, we all hoped he would fulfill. I mean, it ha we have to be honest about that and recognize that the, the talent still exists. The potential still exists. Pittsburgh Steelers are over the moon over the fact that they've got him. So there's something about him that people see that was just unfulfilled in Chicago. So Kevin Warren, Ryan Poles, Matt Lieberfuss, they wanted to do right by Justin Fields. So they let him go to the team he wanted to go to to the situation that he wanted to be in. And they gave him the opportunity that he otherwise would not have gotten. But again, I don't want to, I, I don't want to have a false pretense here. The reason that we're doing that, or the reason that that's happening is because we valued him as a, um, as an athlete, we valued him as a person and there was some potential there. If there weren't potential there, then nobody would give a shit about this. So um, I just want to say that because, I mean, you know, we got rid of Cody White here. We got rid of Eddie Jackson. There was something different here. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but now I move on. Caleb Williams isn't just a solid prospect. He's a sensational prospect. Uh, he's the kind of quarterback the Bears fans have been waiting for a lifetime for since the days of Sid Luckman. I interviewed him after he won the Heisman in 2022 when he had 4,500 yards passing, 42 touchdowns, five picks, 10 rushing TDs, and his smarts, humility, and team-oriented nature and leadership skills poured through. Uh, was his 2023 as stunningly successful? No, but he was still fantastic, throwing 30 touchdowns against five picks, plus scoring 11 times on the ground, doing his best to compensate for an awful Trojan defense. And that's what we really should say about this. Like, we have to remember what the pro when we're talking about Caleb Williams. Um, real quick, to, to look at USC in 2023, other than uh, other than this Louisville game, which they cheated, obviously. Um, <laughs> God damn it, I hate the fact that, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I hate the fact that they did that. Uh, by the way, just in case you didn't know, big time Louisville fan. So um, let's see here. We got uh, the first game of the season uh, was, da, 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 da. Uh, they lost 46 to 45. You know what? Let's pull this up. First game of the season, they lost 46 to 45. The second game against San Jose, San Jose scored four touchdowns on them. Uh, Nevada, 66 to 14. The USC is feeling pretty good. Stanford, 56 to 10. Starting to feel really good about their season. 
Uh, USC, Arizona State, 42 to 28. Then they give up 41 points to Colorado, 41 points to Arizona, 48 points to Notre Dame, 34 points to Utah, 49 points to California, 52 points to Washington, 20, uh, 36 points to Oregon, uh, 38 points to U UCLA. And then, of course, Caleb didn't play in that final USC game uh, against Louisville where they cheated. God damn it. Uh, anyway, Louisville fan, what can I say? But anyway, so guys, they're giving up 40, 50 points a game every single game. And we're putting this all and, and we're trying to because we like, um, you know, we like somebody else or something like that. We're trying to put that on uh, Caleb Williams, not Caleb Williams fault. Look, you know, you can you can argue that one of those close games, you know, uh, might have been, you know, it, it could have been maybe one play or two plays away. Uh, but they, they kind of won the close games. They didn't win against the ranked opponents. Fair enough. But, you know, they had opportunities <coughs> and they had chances. That's um, yeah, Caleb Williams. You know, maybe there's a problem there. Uh, but I, if it's a, there's a problem, it's a very minor, very, very minor sort of problem. Um, I think Caleb is one of the best quarterbacks in the past 25 years as a prospect. And I think he's going to have the greatest rookie season ever by a number one at quarterback. As the Texans did for Stroud, the Bears will be able to give Williams another roster strengthening impact talent in the first round, and they won't have to force the issue. Rather, they can let the draft come to them at nine overall. Might they opt for an offensive lineman or a defensive star with two or three other quarterbacks possibly coming off the board? Would an elite receiver like Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunsey be there? Now, by the way, do, who do you think, what do you think is going to be the move there? You know what I mean? Like, um, is it offensive line? Is it defensive star? Or is it going to be a wide receiver that we take at that nine? Or do we trade it, I guess, would be the other option there. So uh, that's going to definitely be the question. But let's move on here. Look, I think that this team is fantastic. And I think that these guys are right. This team is going to be phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, we're just now kind of understanding you know, when we start to look at their roster and we really let it set in and we let them get into practice and we really start to feel it, I think we're going to look at this and we're going to say that this is the best team that the Bears have fielded in a while by the end of next season. Uh, and I certainly think that a playoff run is in the card. Now, also the Bears are projected to make an elite trade for a $44 million defensive star. Now, I'm not sure how I like this yet or how it intends to play out, right? But the Chicago Bears have taken some big swings uh, and they got Montez Sweat and Jalen Johnson. Uh, Bleacher reports Christopher Knox examined several of the top potential 2024 trade targets whose contract situations could prompt a change of scenery uh, and locked in one particular defensive star for the Bears that will take them to elite status. And that is defensive tackle Jonathan Allen. The Bears who acquired Sweat uh, would be a sensible suitor for Allen if Washington is willing to make him available. They gave they had a stout defensive front after adding Sweat last season, and bringing in Allen could give them a truly elite defensive line. Remember, by the way, we're not even talking about edge anymore. We're now talking about that defensive tackle position. Again, I don't have a problem with Gervon Dexter, but you know when you can bring in an elite guy, I mean, bring him in. Uh, Allen, 29, has racked up 22 sacks and 36 tackles for loss over the past three seasons. Now let that sink in right now. That's a defensive tackle with 22 sacks and 36 tackles for loss. Uh, that's the centerpiece of the commander's defensive line. Made the Pro Bowl in 2021 and 2022. He's under contract for the next two seasons. Uh, and, and he knows that Allen is largely underpaid after Christian Wilkins uh, got that monster money. So his cap hit is 21.4 and 23 million, respectively, over the next two seasons. And because you're now paying and you don't have to worry about Justin Fields' big contract coming up. Now you've got less money invested into uh, your, your draft, if you will. And you have more opportunity uh, from one of those giant contracts. Maybe the Bears can find a way to hit this. Uh, and the question is, can they afford him? Uh, the Bears have committed significant money to Tremaine Edmonds, uh, Montez Sweat, and Jalen Johnson. So it would be very difficult for them to fit this in. So it's really interesting to see, like, who is it that they can move in order to make this play? And, and I don't know. Like, I, you know, I, the more I ask about it, the more I think about it, the more I'm, you know, you look at, um, you, you look at the Bears roster and like, where does the, where does it come from? You know, that's the, uh, that, that's the question, right? And uh, if we just, for example, take a shot here at Chicago Bears.
current contracts, I mean, you really kind of have to look at it. We're going to pull it up on the screen here. Uh, Montes at $24.5 million, Keenan Allen, Jalen Johnson, Tremaine Edmonds, DJ Moore, uh, Cole Komet, Nate Davis. And by the way, we, we come when, when you get the amount that we have available, not it, it's you know 23 million right now, and we still have to have money going into the season, et cetera, et cetera. So who can we make a trade with in order to make something happen? And look, who is overpriced at that point? Well, you know, here is where you kind of look at it um, and, and you look at the average salary here. Average salary, Cole Komet, Nate Davis, you know, maybe Nate Davis, if you can pull up a guard in some context or something like that. But I mean, there's nobody really that you can make that trade with unless you're, you know, you're really kind of pushing, um, uh, you know, some some value out the door in some way. You know, you don't have any horrible contract sitting out here right now. I mean, maybe you could make an argument, Demarcus Walker, but I mean, who do you replace him with? That's 7 million. So that helps to offset some of it. Maybe you package up, um, you know, Demarcus Walker and uh, somebody down the line here. I don't even have one. I mean, guys, I I don't even have one. I don't think it's going to happen, but um, what do you guys think? I mean, do you think that I don't, I just, I don't think that there's any way uh, to, to, to make that kind of happen here, but let's actually move on. Uh, from this, I mean, we're going to keep Jonathan. Uh, we're going to keep Jonathan Allen on the radar just in case something happens. But uh, then let's do this. Justin Fields is now going to wear number five in Pittsburgh. So, um, you know, what I mean, um, you know, uh, matter of fact, I actually did what I think they're going to do in my draft today. So, Patriot, if you'll give me just a moment, I think I'm going to go over that. Um, and um, MHJ, uh, so MHJ is actually four inches taller than his dad. Marvin Harrison was six foot, 185 pounds. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is six foot four, 215. So yeah, he's uh, he, he's a big, big boy. Um, he, he's a monster. I, I don't think he's going to be available at nine, by the way. If he's available at nine, all bets are off. I'm taking him no matter what. I don't give a shit. Uh, I'm, I'm taking Marvin Harrison, but uh, so anyway, Mar- uh, Steelers are going to uh, use number five for Justin Fields. And uh, then we've got four former Steelers who are, are four former Bears who are still having trouble finding jobs. Now, uh, if you know what the list is, don't waste it for anybody. Number one on that list, uh, still looking for a job that still hasn't found it. Robert Tanyan. Uh, Robert Tanyan uh, has not found a job yet. Uh, there's possibility. Now you, you go back and you look at it last season. He was a bit of a disappointment. He only played 28% of the snaps and he was only targeted 17 times. He had 11 receptions for 112 yards and zero touchdowns. One thing we would have liked to see out of Tanyan would be the touchdown against the Browns, which could have greatly impacted the outcome of that game. A wide open deep touchdown pass from Justin Fields was dropped by Tanyan in what could only be described as your typical Bears moment. And by the way, the Bears lost that game 20 to 17 this would have been the game changer that gave them the win. This is why I say there's so many different little plays here that would have given the Bears an opportunity to win just a little bit more and been just a little bit more into it. Like it would have been, it would have been nice to see. So um, he's turning 30 and this is going to be his third team. Is he going to get one? Uh, I mean, you know, somebody will come calling. Uh, he did have a spectacular 2021 uh, before, uh, you know, regressing a little in 2022 and then coming to the Bears in 2023 to regress even more. Uh, the number two guy on this list is going to be one that I think might be coming back to the Bears, and that's Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, now, Ngakwe hadn't finished a season with less than eight sacks to this point, even though he played for five teams before joining the Bears. Uh, that gave fans a bit of hope, uh, but he finished with a career low of four sacks and never really took the step forward. The trade for Montez Sweat helped fix the issue that he had, which was getting double team. So it could be if he can get a favorable deal from the Bears, he becomes the pass rusher that we've wanted or needed. And we've desperately needed a real pass rusher that we can throw into obvious passing downs. Yannick Ngakwe fits that bill, and he's an upgrade from Demarcus Walker. And remember, um, the the when Demarcus Walker started on that, and that's when we became an elite pass uh, or a run stopper we were already a good run stopper but we became a better run stopper with demarcus walker so you know it'd be a rotation if that happens so uh, the questions would be if yannick and gakwe does not sign soon maybe the bears get a favorable deal and can bring him back and just perhaps 
perhaps he can be a little bit better this year and he can actually get back to that eight wins. Remember, he was injured uh, and he did have some serious problems. Now, the next one up was Eddie Jackson. And of course, as soon as he got the monster contract and they make sure to point it out, uh, he burst onto the scene. He became a takeaway uh, machine after Jackson received his heavy contract, hefty contract extension, though, his play immediately took a downward turn. His tackling became lackluster and his effort was simply not good enough. He was beaten on coverage on a regular basis and constantly allowing plays to go behind him with consistency. So, you know what I mean? Uh, and then the last one is Cody Whitehair. By the way, remember, I did point this out. Cody Whitehair had a great season in 2023, despite being a reserve and, and despite being a backup, he actually, when you come out and look at it, had a fantastic season overall and was rated as one of the highest offensive guards in the league, despite he had limited, uh, he had limited playing time, but he did come off and, and do very well only in the guard position at center. You know, uh, we'd already decided he was not the one. So it uh, could be that we're seeing some kind of, and by the way, that's why I put Yannick Ngakwe on the screenshot here, because I think Yannick Ngakwe is probably, um, I don't know if he's the ace in the, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if he's the, the ace in the hole, if you will, but it, it looks like that maybe we should see Yannick Ngakwe show back up uh, at some point. And, and that would resolve at least some of the problems that, uh, that we see, you know? Uh, so now uh, let's move on. The defensive roster, very little has been changed uh, about what we see on the defensive roster. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, it doesn't matter how you look at it. Uh, Demarcus Walker, I mean, I don't have a problem with him. I don't think he's great, but I don't have a problem with him. And Gravon Dexter, I think Gravon Dexter is probably going to be a monster. I mean, I really do. So, you know, mayhap he ends up being a super stud, you know, uh, not yet. And maybe we don't need Jonathan Allen. I mean, I, I would like to. I would like to stick with Gravon Dexter. And the only reason, by the way, that I'm saying Gravon Dexter as a sub or a backup or or anything like that, the only reason I'm even bringing that up is because other people are saying it. Uh, for me, Gravon Dexter represents a. I mean, I think he's a pretty decent player overall, and uh, he's a he's a young player who has a chance to develop and get even stronger uh, and better. And uh, now somebody did point out yesterday. I thought Eric Washington. Um, what would what was a defensive line guy, and he was. Um, oh god damn it! You know what? I'm not even thinking about the right. I'm thinking about somebody else. I was talking about Braxton Jones in my brain. I was confusing Gervon Dexter with Braxton Jones. Braxton Jones was the guy with the problem on the offensive line. Anyway, this is the lineup right here. I think this is how we start the season. If Yannick and Gakwe is here, maybe there's a swap between edge rusher, but I, I think that this is pretty much locked in. And I'm also not feeling good about a defender being taken with a ninth selection, even if Dallas Turner is available because a lot of quarterbacks are going to be taken right away. So uh, then you have the offense over here. I still have a hole at Tyler Scott, which I fixed, by the way, in my draft today. Only had five selections, but I did trade down one of the picks in order to pick up an extra selection. And I think I solved a, a few of the problems with the, now there's still holes, by the way, in my, in my uh, draft that I just, I can't, you know, there's not enough draft picks to fix most of what needs to be fixed. Uh, if you just take the fact that Caleb Williams is basically, uh, he's penciled in at the moment, but I think he's going to be inked in by the, by the end of this as the draft pick, like he's going to be the one. Um, but then after that, you've got Braxton Jones, uh, Coleman Shelton as, you know, Coleman Shelton only has one year on that contract. So very possible. We're going to have to move on, but we'll worry about that later. So, uh, this is what the draft is going to look like when we get to that. And by the way, before we do this, uh, I do have on these mock drafts, the first one up is not mine. This is from Frank Parton. Frank Parton is, is a, a, a member of the channel, uh, does watch. By the way, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. certainly helps me out uh, tremendously to continue to provide you guys with content. Um, so his draft was really one of trading down because he felt, again, like I do, that we have to have more draft capital. Uh, so he went with uh, J.J. McCarthy in his draft, which is what we've been doing uh, for the week. Uh, then he goes with Jackson Powers Johnson, Tyler Newbin at safety, Darius Robinson at edge rusher, Cedric Van Pran Granger at the uh, center position, third best center in the draft, by the way, Caden Stover at tight end, Johnny Wilson from Florida State at wide receiver, Brendan Rice, uh, wide receiver from USC, which is going to be ironic because I did take Brendan Rice today in my draft. Uh, then you have Makai Wingo. I love Makai Wingo, by the way, and Jordan Jefferson, defensive tackles out of LSU. I thought they did a fantastic job. Then you have punter 
Tory Taylor, and then Edge Gabriel Murphy. So you got a couple of edge rushers in here. Again, Darius Robinson, I think, is going to be one of those steals of the draft. I don't think we're going to be able to get him, but it'll be one of the steals of the draft. Uh, and then um, um, Brendan Rice, because he's familiar with um, with Caleb Williams, I have a sense or a feeling that maybe, just maybe, he might be one of those guys that just shows out a lot early on in the season. You know what I mean? Like it, 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 there's 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 very possible uh, or very possibly you know one of these um, uh, one of these breakout guys early in the season. You know what I mean? You put him on your fantasy football team, not thinking anything, and then all of a sudden he explodes and just kind of blows up. I think he's one of those guys. Uh, does he do it by the end of the year? I don't know. You know, but for right now. Um, it, it could be. So, uh, as far as this draft goes, like, I, I mean, that's, that's, what is it? Nine, that's four, that's 15, 12 picks, 12 picks. Plus you got the new England first round, Washington first round. Uh, you got the, the Rams second round pick in 2025. And then you've got a seventh round pick, um, uh, later on from Tennessee. So a lot of draft trades, uh, a lot of piling up picks, which I don't think we're going to do that this year. Unfortunately, I think that's going to be something for next year. And I think that we're going to see a lot of drafting, a lot of trading down and a lot of picking up a lot of picks. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think that that's what's going to happen. And I don't think there's a chance that that's going to happen anyway. Um, at seven to 10 for a rookie is normal. It's not going to happen. They're going to win 12 games. They're going to, they're going to win at least 11 games, uh, 11 or 12, maybe even 13 and four. If we get on a, a, a real good run, I don't, I don't see that. And I know, again, I know I'm splitting hairs when I talk about it, but 11 wins is going to be the floor here. Uh, no matter what anybody said in their stupid DraftKings list, um, this is going to be the Cinderella team. That's why we started off with the NFL showing a Cinderella team. Well, here's my draft, by the way. This is what I did. At number one, I took Caleb Williams. Uh, I went back to what I was, I, you know, I said I was going to do this for a week not picking Caleb Williams, but it doesn't make any sense at this point. It's, it's obvious now that Caleb Williams is that guy. Uh, he's the new him, if you will. Uh, and and Caleb Williams is going to be that number one guy. Well, number nine, I was going to trade down. He was going to, you know, I was going to start to use that to try to accumulate draft capital. But then something magical happened. Uh, everybody took a quarterback. Everybody took a wide receiver. And guess what was left? Joe Alt at the offensive tackle at number nine. Um, and, and 1848 revolt. I know he's not. I, it, it's, you know, I, I know he's not. But you know what I mean? Like, it, it, we have to move on. So Joe Alt at number nine. And I think that that fixes, you know, that's, uh, th this actually fixes the offense. This is, and, and, and not only did we fix that offense, or at least we fixed a few pieces of that offense, I brought in Brendan Rice with that number 126 picks, which, which we'll get to in just a second here. And at number 75, I brought in MHJ2. Uh, he's the sequel. Michael Hall Jr., defensive tackle out of Ohio State. Does that make the the, uh, the defensive line better? I think it gives it a little bit more depth. And Michael Hall is used to playing in big situations, big game situations. So I think that he represents it at, at least a good backup for this team. And then at number 126, this is that slot guy. This is Brendan Rice, son of Jerry Rice. Would be incredible to see Brendan Rice come in here. Uh, Brendan Rice come in, comes in here hitting the ground running, if you will. Is he going to be able to play against elite defenders? I, you know, probably not. But I think that the fact that if Caleb Williams is even close to as good as advertised, if he's even close then I think that Brendan Rice will look like a superstar early on. Again, I don't see him through the whole season doing this, and he'll have spurts and moments because he's going to have to learn the NFL, and everything is going to be around Caleb Williams being successful. But there we go. Um, that's an opportunity uh, for Caleb Williams to have a familiar guy. So some great opportunity right here. And then uh, number 169 is Xavier Thomas. And look, I don't know much about him. Um, he was the best end that was available at that spot. So there we go. I mean, there's the, this is, this is what it would look like. And this is what I feel like would probably be along the lines of what you see in this draft. Remember, uh, what I had here was the the one pick, the nine pick, the 75, and the 122. And what I did uh, is I traded down on the 122 
and moved to 126 and I grabbed up at 169. You know who I traded with? Green Bay. Fuck those guys. So um, I, I traded Green Bay uh, for that pick and got 126, 169. Then we got Brendan Rice and Xavier Thomas. So there we are. Um, this is a potential. And and look, I'm not saying that this is, this is right. Um, I think Caleb Williams is, of course, right. Um, but it looks like from here, uh, we've, we've certainly got an opportunity to grow. We've got an opportunity to grow. And by the way, guys, I do want to say this. Um, I know I told you that uh, I wasn't going to talk about Justin Fields anymore. I, I know I told you that. And, and when it comes to day-to-day uh, -day stuff, you know, all the stuff we're talking about right now, when it comes to this day-to-day -day stuff, we're probably, what are we talking about? Unless there's some news out, like the news today that he was going to switch jerseys to number five. We still don't know, by the way, whether Caleb Williams or Keenan Allen is going to wear number 13. Caleb hasn't joined the team, so we can't pick a jersey, if you will. Uh, so we don't know those pieces, but I am going to put out one more video um, for Caleb Williams. If you don't want to watch it, that's cool. If you do want to watch it, then it really it's going to be my explanation for what I think went wrong with Justin Fields on this team and how it's not going to be the same with Caleb and how they're going to do right by Caleb, even though you can still be mad with the fact that they did Justin wrong. And did they do Justin wrong? I mean, even Kevin Pohl or even Ryan Poles has said that and admitted as much. And so has Matt Eberflus for that matter. They said, look, we, you know, we could have done better with Justin, but we were in a position where it was impossible. And then when this situation came into our lap, you've run out of we can't just throw $25 million at maybe. Even if even if we see all the talent in the world, we can't throw $25 million at maybe knowing that we got to pay $40 million the next year. We can't put that much money into a project. And Justin Fields at this point is still a project. So that leads us to Caleb Williams. And we can throw $9 million a year at a project, especially one with potentially tremendous upside. That's the gamble that you take in this context, right? So we're going to have, I'm going to have a video coming out in the next day or two that's going to really discuss and break that down for you. Uh, hopefully, and the reason that I want to do that is because, look, we need to have that conversation. Uh, some of us need to really kind of recognize that, you know, we have to, you can't be mad at the Chicago Bears for doing right uh, by the team. And look, you can be mad that they didn't do quote unquote right by Justin Fields. I understand that. Believe me, I, I, I understand it, uh, because I still, you know, to this moment, I would still love to see Justin Fields on the field, but that's a personal preference, right? Uh, that's not a, a, that's not, that's not what's best for the Chicago bears. What's best for the Chicago bears is saving that payroll so that they can go out and they can get somebody like a Jonathan Allen, which they cannot do if they're paying that much money to the quarterback position or, or to go get Keenan Allen for two or three more years, which they cannot do if they have to pay, uh, uh Justin Fields. So this was what was best for the team. End of story. And I'm going to explain that in the video. And then, you know, hopefully, I mean, I don't know if you guys are going to agree or not. Like, you you, you know, you, you, if you don't like Justin Fields, nothing I say is going to change it. And if you do like Justin Fields, nothing I say is going to make you like Caleb anymore, I don't think. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when, I'm, when we're talking about this, uh, I do want to address something because there was a lot of people talking about uh, the fact that 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 Caleb Williams had a pink phone and had his fingernails painted. And people were like, bleh, 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 bleh. Uh, Caleb, William, uh, Caleb Williams' uh, mother, who raised him, um, she worked as a nail technician, and he paints his fingernails as an honor to her. Like it, it's to 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 be part of the memory of her. And you may not like that. You may not. I don't want my Chicago Bears quarterback having painted fingernails or whatever the fuck you say. Right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, this guy's a kid. Uh, th this guy uh, thinks that it's important to honor his his mother in, in a small way. He's been doing it for about three years now. Uh, it hasn't affected his on-field performance, if you will. What's affected his on-field performance the most is having a shitty defense. Uh, that's what's affected him the most. So um, I'm not I'm gonna make my pitch in this video to give the guy a chance. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't work out. Maybe we're looking for another quarterback again in a couple of years. Maybe, you know, all of it falls apart. I don't think that it will. I think Ryan Poles has built a great and fantastic team. I think that this is going to be an amazing team, in fact. However, um, you know, it could all fall apart. But, I mean, hey, we're the Chicago Bears fans, right? We're used to it. So anything that goes to the upside, yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. So hopefully uh, you guys will, um, 
you know, I, I hope at this point um, that, that you guys understand um, that, you know, we're going to check this out. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to just, we're going to talk about it. We're going to figure it out. And God damn it. The Chicago bears are playoff bound. They are going to be a fantastic team. And I hope that you guys uh, understand that, you know, nothing that I say, by the way, uh, should be taken as financial advice because I am not a financial advisor. Uh, Bitcoin to the moon, baby. Uh, seventy-one thousand for those of you that are that are Bitcoin maxi. Seventy-one thousand today. Um, for for if you don't know, I'm on a Solana long right now. Got in at one twenty one eighty-two. Trading at 186 right now, uh, so I'm feeling that. And I just partnered with a uh, meme coin called Myro. Myro uh, is well, I, I partnered with them a little while back, but I just repartnered with them again today. So uh, if you watch my crypto content, you're going to see me doing some stuff on Myro today, uh, and then of course my normal stuff. So uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you that you take the time to come check me out every single day, guys. It is going to be a fantastic season for the Chicago Bears. Uh, can I promise you that? No. Uh, would I? Would I? Would I like to see that? Hell yeah. Uh, but let's uh, let's bear down, and uh, we'll talk to you. Again.